Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Aggieville Alley Cats podcast, where come rain, shine, or anything in between, we're here to deliver to you the Kansas State sporting news that you so love. I'm Ace Edwards, right alongside Connor Baltazor, and we're significantly happier this week. You know, I speaking for myself, I'm much happier. <laughs> I don't want to speak for you or put words in your mouth. No, I, I'm happier. Oh, well, great. We're on the same page then. <laughs> but... It was another great Wildcat victory up against UCF. It was a 44-31 victory. Uh, I'm not going to count that last touchdown, so it was a 44-24 victory. And just on top, it was a really great crowd in a way that you and I perhaps did not expect. I mean, we expected it to be a sellout because I think at this point every game will be unless the wheels just absolutely fall off at some point, which I don't... I don't think will happen, but you know it was it was a really great crowd, especially towards the back end of the third quarter and the beginning of the fourth quarter, where it got loud enough to where you and I couldn't talk with one another because it was just our ears were ringing. Yeah, my voice is more sore than it's been in a while after a football game. Uh, you mentioned to me at the game that your ears were ringing uh, a little bit. Uh, Scott Wildcat tweeted that the East Club was shaking before the game. I don't know if that continued on into the uh, late third, early fourth, where it really got loud. But yeah, I was expecting a solid crowd. Um, I didn't expect them to get as into it as they did uh, when it came time to to really buckle down. But we got some huge defensive stops right when we needed them. And we started to take control on offense. And also help that we were um, at least in some way maybe influencing uh, delay of games. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm never really sure how much crowd influence there is on those or not, but like it at least felt like it because they were timed with the loudest points of the game uh, where the crowd got really loud and uh, Timmy McClain for, of, USCF, of UCF lost uh, track of the uh, clock a few times and was struggling to communicate with his offense. Yeah, my throat was also sore for a completely separate reason, but that is, it was, it was another incident of someone on the UCF sideline. Well, it, it it seems like one per year where someone instigates the student section and I make it a personal problem. <laughs> yeah, there's a guy that made, the second that he shushed the student section, everything went downhill after that for okay. UCF. Yep, and uh, I I made sure that he knew about it. <laughs> Yeah, because I think after that, that, because it would have been 24-24 when he did that. So we went on to score uh, three unanswered touchdowns, or 20 (laughs) unanswered total, I guess. Mm -hmm. So He didn't turn around again after that. No, he did not. I can't say I blame him. but (laughs) (laughs) Only real men talk when they're down 20. (laughs) But the other part, because we don't cover special teams all that much, uh, the kicking was questionable this, like, and I don't want to like raise alarm bells for it yet because I think one the laces may have been out because it was a knuckleball, which is like a very strange. Like I remember some kicks last year for Tenet were knuckleballs, but it seemed like that, especially the one really close field goal, was really strange. But I I'm not sounding alarm bells yet, but it's something to keep an eye on. Yeah, I, I've seen a lot of people really getting worried about the kicking game. I'm not, like like he's I'm not quite there yet. Because uh, Tennant otherwise has looked pretty good this year mm-hmm. uh, compared to last year. He's generally been more confident. Um, so if it becomes a consistent issue, then I'll get worried about it. But um, we can get away with a bad game here or there. We've, I've seen worse in my time at K-State. Uh, so... I, I'm not. I'm not really super worried about it. I am worried about special teams as a whole, just because yeah. generally it wasn't very a, a very good night. Um, Other than random punt, you're becoming yeah. a legend. Yeah, our one punt of the evening was fantastic from Jack Bloomer, and then Brandon Platner uh, getting the fantastic stop in a uh, um, punt coverage. Uh, that was a really good sequence for special teams. Uh, but beyond that, kick coverage wasn't amazing. Kickoffs weren't amazing either, at least for the most part. Uh, and it generally just was a bit of a lackluster night 
uh, for special teams, and Seth Porter came up limping after he um, had a return. Our returns weren't great either. Uh, just for well below the standards that we should expect at K-State for special teams. Yeah, I, I will say that KJ's return, despite the rocky start, still ended up getting decent yardage. I just wish it didn't have the rocky start. No, I completely understand. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, it, for the most part, was a subpar uh, to bad special teams night for K-State. Yeah. Other general takeaway or, I mean, thing we noticed is Will looks noticeably faster than he's ever been, and that's when he's... Uh, I think the estimate climbing gave was like 80%, which, all right. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know if I believe him. Um, he may be lying. Yeah, he could be lying, although Will was looking a little uh, gimpy pregame. Uh, I imagine some of it's probably just adrenaline. Will just wasn't feeling the pain as much later in the game. Uh, so I, 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 it may be that, but at the same time, he did look faster on that last touchdown run he had than I remember ever seeing him look. Um, even back when he was a freshman and sophomore and was running more, uh, he looked like a genuine pure dual threat QB, uh, which was kind of shocking. Like he, he, we remarked about it uh, to each other that he did look really fast during the game, uh, at least for Will standards. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he's not Avery. Yeah, definitely not Avery. Um, but I think he's probably the second fastest QB on the roster, unless Knuth is fast. Maybe. Probably. Yeah, because he's definitely faster than Ripley, and he's almost certainly faster than Lara. But still, um, Will looks surprisingly healthy for what we expected. I think. Yeah. And then finally, people were complaining about the time management at the end of the first half. Why? I mean, he was killing, like, we were killing clock. It was a third down in a red zone situation. There were 16 seconds left on the clock. You can afford to bleed the clock there a little bit. In fact, you probably should. And lo and behold, nothing came of it because the clock was bled. Stop crying about it. Anyway, (laughs) moving on to game day grades. Where we are going to, like always, we go through every single position group and give them a ranking on a scale of F to A+. F meaning they nearly single-handedly lost us the game, or A+, meaning they almost near single-handedly won us the game. We also include coordinators in this ranking, but we're going to start with the man under center, and that would be Will Howard. Now, the vitamin interceptions are getting increasingly concerning. Because I don't like the fact that it's one per game at this point. I think that's getting frustrating. And it's not... It's almost like the interceptions are getting worse with each game. The first game, I don't think that was really his fault. He was getting hit while he was throwing and couldn't get behind it. The Troy game wasn't that bad. I mean, you can justify the decision. It's just the wrong throw. Uh, The Mizzou game was right decision wrong throw and this one was just wrong (laughs) like you can't when someone undercuts the slant route like that you can't throw the slant on the rpo but outside of that and you know a few overthrows it was a generally pretty solid game but i think towards the back end with that final scramble and run or option run i should say it pushed it up to a b plus i wanted more but I'm more than happy with the performance. Yeah, I fell in a pretty pretty similar boat. Uh, him getting those two rushing touchdowns was a huge boost, I thought, and him being a pretty effective runner as well in the day, uh, only taking one sack. Um, the pick was bad. There's no getting around that. It was his worst pick of the year, I do agree, because uh, it was a bad decision, and if you're going to make a bad decision at least try and place it a little better, but he gave it straight to the defender. Uh, and he was missing a few open guys long. Uh, there was that one series in particular where he missed Keegan Johnson, and then the following play missed Oakley, missed Oakley. Which I know made you sad. Yeah, I really upset that Garrett Oakley <laughs> didn't get a reception in his return. I was really hoping for uh, that because he was so close, but just didn't quite get it. Uh which overthrowing is better than underthrowing, but still, Will's a senior, and 
he's got high expectations. He's got to make those throws. Uh, not every time, but he needs to be making them with more efficiency. Um, regardless, he did not have a bad day at all. And with the gift of hindsight, he was pretty good. But he wasn't great, and we know that he can be better. Uh, so I give him a B-. minus. Yes, that's fair. Uh, running backs, G. I wonder. <laughs> um, DJ Giddens had a game for the ages. Because on the ground... He had 30 attempts for 207 yards, but then proceeded to catch eight more passes for 86 yards. Oh, and also four touchdowns. Gee, I wonder what grade they got. Yeah, it's an A+. Specifically for DJ. Tony Frias actually did some pretty decent stuff as well with a run and a really impressive catch. Um, yeah, I mean, A+. One of the easiest a I've ever given. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, there's no way to get around an A plus here for the running backs. Uh, I had committed to an A plus for, or to at least an A for the running backs by like the end of the first half, basically. Yep. And then DJ went out and did the exact same thing again. So that is a lock A plus. He's so slow, by the way. He doesn't have any yeah. moves. I we talked about it all off season and how there's a un, unfair stereotype about DJ Giddens just being a pure power back that can't move, that's a statue that only is effective in a straight line and can't be elusive. Yesterday he proved uh, the complete opposite, that he's able to put his foot in the ground and get around people. He's got a spin move. He's got a really nice juke. He's got good vision. And he can create runs on his own, independent of the offensive line, uh as long as they don't get completely destroyed. Mm -hmm. He was fantastic. Uh, It was, funnily enough, maybe the best running back uh, performance that we've seen in a long time. And now I'm including every Deuce Vaughn game. Yeah. Uh, Because Deuce Vaughn never hit 200 yards of uh, rushing yards. And uh, I think he probably had four total touchdowns at least a couple of times, probably. Um, But still, DJ Giddens... He had nearly 300 yards of uh, all-purpose, which is second or third all-time for K-State, behind two Darren Sproles instances of it against Louisiana in the Big 12 championship game. I mean, this was nothing but an A-plus game. If, if we did A-plus-plus, plus, it would be an A-plus-plus. Plus. Because uh, for when the offense wasn't really working, he put the team on his back, and he made it work. And he deserves a ton of credit for that. And I hope he gets to enjoy a nice fishing outing, because he has earned one. <laughs> A-plus for the running backs. And shout-out Tony Frias as well. He had a really tough catch um, at one point in the game that I did not expect to see from him. Nope. I was unsure why we put him in the slot, and then it made sense, because <laughs> he had a nice worked. catch. So shout-out to um, Big Tone Anthony Frias. Uh, <laughs> nice game for him as well. Receivers... Best way to describe it is pedestrian. They didn't really do anything all that special. Phil gave up on another route, which, granted, the ball was tipped. But, come on. <laughs> I, I gave them a C, and I think that if there's any room to... Well, if there's any offensive room that we can shift the alarm bells to, it might be receivers. Um, because KJ, on the kick return, looked really good. But he still obviously hobbled. RJ couldn't go any time past the first series. Phil is the only like consistent option out there. And that's not what you want. Because um, Phil, and this is no disrespect to Philip Brooks, he should be the security blanket option. But that's about it. I gave them a C. It's just they were really pedestrian. Yeah, I gave him a C plus. Pretty similar reasons. Um, not an enthusing day from them. Philip Brooks was fine. He had a run that was pretty uneventful. Uh, Jaden Jackson had a couple of uh, nice concentration grabs. He had a catch in traffic, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, Keegan Johnson, again, we're still waiting to see more from him. I think the bye week could be really big for Keegan Johnson. Uh, not my best um, offensive 
MVP pick pregame. Oh, I did. I, I picked pretty well. <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> um, Keegan Johnson, still looking for more from him. Seth Porter did get a catch, though, and looked very scared after he had the catch. <laughs> Immediately ran to the sideline. So I, I was pretty happy with that. Uh, so I gave them a C plus, um, almost entirely because I was just happy to see Seth get a catch. And I'm also, I gave them a little leeway just because I know that room is really banged up right now, but they need to get healthy in a bad way. Yeah. Uh, tight ends, fullbacks, mostly just Ben Sinnott with a supporting cast from occasionally Christian Moore and Garrett Oakley and most Swanson. Um... The big thing that I'm getting caught on here is blocking. Because Ben Sinnott whiffed an uncomfortable amount of blocks. Especially when he's being like a lead sift blocker or someone who's going into a gap explicitly to, you know, at least get in the way. He was just whiffing really bad and a lot. (laughs) And it was getting really frustrating. Receiving wise, you know, 5 for 64, you don't sneeze at that. And Will Sonson. One for ten. Garrett Oakley, maybe three centimeters away from a big catch. B. That's exactly what I gave them. I wanted to give them more, but I also could not get over the blocking. Uh, There was one play in particular for Ben Sinnott that was just atrocious enough to drop them a part of a grade on its own. And uh, it was... I think in the first half, and it was a running play to DJ Giddens, and he's pulling around and going up the middle to block, and a linebacker, as he's pulling, is looking him right in the face, and then he just goes past him to pick up somebody else. And then we get stuffed at the line for no gain. And that was kind of a good microcosm of Benson Sinnott's run blocking this year, which has just taken a significant step back, I think. Uh, There were a couple of times he did actually have some pretty good run blocks, but the bad outweighed the good in that department. Um, But he was still a good receiver. Uh, He, I mean, if I catch it for 64 yards, that's pretty good. Um, Will Swanson finally got a catch, and then, like you said, Garrett Oakley should have uh, had a catch. The throw was just a little too far, and I'm not blaming Garrett Oakley for it because he has extremely long arms. Yeah, if you can't. Yeah. But, like, you could really see it on the highlight. He stretched out as much as he could and uh, jumped a little bit as well. Uh, Garrett Oakley could not have gotten... Uh, Any like, more yeah, Like, that was the most he was going to be able to do to try and get that ball. So it's just a slight overthrow. It's tough to ding Will for it, but he, you've got to hit those um, at least a bit. So I gave the tight ends a B. Yeah. Offensive line, I'm really happy with how they bounce back. And credit where credit's due, you know, we've been dunking on Carver a lot. He had a pretty solid game. Wasn't amazing, but it was solid. He wasn't noticeable, which is what you want from your right tackle. But even outside of him, the offensive line had an altogether really, really good day outside of Hayden Gillum, just sometimes doing Hayden Gillum things. But... I gave them an A-. I'm really happy with generally how they played, especially in the pass block game when they knew they had to step up when, you know, you have a a hobbled quarterback back there. Like, you have to protect the guy back there. I gave them a B+. Um, This was their best game on the year. Uh, It's not close, Mm -hmm. I think. Um, Pass blocking, they were excellent. Uh, Only the one sack was given up. Um, Duffy had a few pass block reps where he clearly just wasn't quite 100% yet and just got beat. And uh, so those weren't his best moments. But yeah, Carver looked better, um, or at the very least didn't look as bad. And uh, he took a step forward, and that that was good to see. Um, And I also, um, again, liked how we uh, shuffled the, uh, the line a bit. Um, at times, uh, we got to see some more Taylor Poitier, too. Uh, Panzer has quietly had a really nice year, I think. Um, KT generally has been good, too. Of course, Cooper Beebe is Cooper Beebe. So. And there's not much to say there, but they could have been a little better in run blocking, which I know sound, 
sounds counterintuitive <laughs> given that DJ Giddens ran for over 200 yards. And we had nearly 300 total in running the ball. Um, but a lot of times DJ was having to kind of um, create his own yards um, at times with how many run blocks um, were missed at various times. Uh, other times we did a really good job run blocking, especially later in the game, it felt like. It uh, feels like this offensive line is really well conditioned, and that's a big advantage for us late in games. But we um, still could be better in the run blocking department by a little bit. Otherwise, pass blocking, I was fairly happy with for the most part. So I still gave them a B plus and a good grade, but I'm being more nitpicky with them than I've been all year, which is really good. So <laughs> very, very happy with how the offensive line was. Yeah. Moving on to the defensive side of the ball. The defensive line room, I've never given a room a grade too off from what I wanted to give them. But it was just a matter of them being so close so many times and then just not being able to finish it out. I ended up giving the D-line an A-. minus. They were so close to an A+, plus if they just finished out a play. Which, granted, a lot of times they were getting held. Um, really badly and really obviously, but, you know, they had a pretty solid game. Uh, actually, I'd say they had more than a solid game. Uso, Nate, uh, Khalid Duke, and Brendan Mont all register sacks, which, you know, they each got a sack, and I guarantee you they each got more pressures than that. Uh, Khalid Duke also got a TFL. I'm happy with their performance. It's just... I gave them an A minus because, dang man, you really like, this could have easily been like a seven or eight sack game. Yeah, no, I'm with you there. Um, for the most part, the defensive line was really good. I gave them a B plus just because, like you said, they were so close, um, but they just weren't quite able to finish as much as they needed to. Uh, Brendan Mott had a, a huge sack late in the game. Uh, Khalid Duke had a sack. Nate Matlick had a sack. Uso had a sack as well, uh, which all that was impressive. I enjoyed all of that, uh, but you, I just needed a little bit more in terms of actual production. Again, the pressures, I imagine were pretty good. I don't know if we have access to those numbers, but I was generally pretty happy with the, uh, the pressure um, that we got on the defensive side of the ball. So, uh, I, at times late in the game, I guess you could say they got um, a, a little bit gassed um, in a few occasions. Which, uh, like, when which, plays are going on yeah. for that long. Yeah, especially that really long one that lasted, like... Five years. Yeah, like 10 or 15 seconds or whatever it was. Uh, although we eventually, I think, ended up getting the sack on that play. Um, so it, it could have been a lot worse. But I'm pretty happy with what def- we did defensively. Um, at least on the defensive line. Uh, could have been a little better in the run game. Uh, we could get gashed a few times, though that's more on the linebackers, I think, which we'll get into in a second. Uh, but pressure-wise, we were getting there a pretty decent amount. So uh, pretty happy with that. We got to... Um, Oh, what's his name? Timmy McClain. Yeah, Timmy McClain. Uh, we got to him, uh, what was it, uh, 14 times? Yeah, we ended up getting to him, yeah, 14, on a 14 dropbacks, he was under pressure, which was 43.8% of his dropbacks. And his passer rating, his PFF grade went to 28.9. Yeah, so getting to Timmy McClain was huge uh, in creating pressure. That was massive uh, for us winning uh, and being able to hold them off late. Uh, but yeah, defensive line, they were really good. Uh, B plus for them. Linebackers, I knew this was one of the biggest points of concern. Let me tell you something right now. Dez had an awesome game. Austin Moore had a solid game. And splitting Austin Romaine and Jake Clifton had a okay game. Um Austin Romaine, on like the second play of the game, blew a run fit, which is why they had a really long run at the beginning of the game, which you really don't want and can't have. But that's also just kind of that's just kind of what happens when you have a true freshman playing. 
But Dez and Austin Moore honestly kind of carry the group to a B plus. Jake was doing his damnedest to both get it up to an A and take it down to a C. <laughs> because the, the late hits were brutal. But he was also flying around so much in a game that we didn't even expect him to play. So that was awesome to see. But uh, B plus. Yeah. I was a little more generous. Not by a lot. I gave him an A minus. The main reason that I did that was just because of how fantastic Desmond Purnell was, how much pressure Austin Moore was under, and he did a pretty good job with that. And also the um, stage for Austin Romain. That was a pretty tough stage. Granted, he was kind of brutal uh, early in the game. Uh, There was one long run early in the game where it came down exclusively to him filling the wrong gap, and that was really, really tough. Uh, for him Uh, but he did have a a really nice tackle for loss at one point he had a a few other solid tackles he I think for starting as a true freshman did about as well as he could especially uh, one who was um, unheralded and while he did have a a really nice camp a really nice spring uh, he, he still isn't someone that was coming in with the intent of playing immediately I don't think and Jake Clifton, he reminded us why he's so important, even though sometimes he did mess up a little bit. He also was, um, I believe, the person responsible for helping to um, mess up one of Timmy McLean's throws that ended up being an interception. Mm-hmm. So uh, there was a lot of give and take with Jake Clifton, um, but I think it ultimately ended up measuring out to be more give. Uh, I, I think that he... Uh, one of those that was almost a uh, uh, roughing the passer. I was convinced it was a roughing the passer because yeah, it was because it was about the same as the one before, but uh, they decided not to call it. So that that was huge. It worked out in our favor. But I'm generally pretty happy with how the linebackers were, especially given the circumstances of how banged up that room was, especially at Mike. Uh, so good game for them. They got an A minus. Yeah. Defensive backs, certainly better than last week, but um, not great. They were fine. They were slightly above fine, and some of that comes down to bad luck. Um, again, because I'm not sure that this luck, I'm not sure the defensive back room's luck will get any better anytime soon. Uh, will Lee getting toasted was the low light of the day, but... There was also a few trick plays and situations where you need to be in a better position to make the play. And some of that, you know, you get toasted as a defensive back. That's going to happen. Um, shout out to Marquis Siegel for having a, a huge bounce back game. He was a baller in run support and wasn't bad in coverage. But they made enough mistakes. I just gave them a C plus. Like... It's the pick was nice. Parrish's pick was really nice, and Parrish has consistently been the highlight player. But getting toasted and then getting tricked on a few plays, including being a part of the reason why two consecutive draw plays worked, eh, I'm good. C plus. I gave them a C. Um, Parrish had a really nice pass breakup um, at one point, and he had a, um, of course, the pick. Uh, happy for him to get his first interception. Uh, he now has one more than Echo Boydo did in his entire career, which is a travesty <laughs> that Echo never got a pick. Because no one threw his way. That is true. That is part of it. Uh, Batney also had a pick uh, get called back once because of a late hit or something. Oh, that's right. Back in 2020 against TCU. Um, but um, also Will Lee had a really nice pass breakup at one point. Uh, like you said, Siegel, really good in run support. Um, but I still get back to we're getting burnt over the top more than we should. I get that we're an aggressive defense, but we did not get burnt over the top this much last year. And I've it, it's really been frustrating to see it kind of happen over and over and over again when we know a majority of what the issue is. Uh, but we keep biting on play action way too hard. Uh, we bit on the flea flicker horribly. I mean, that was just awful. How 
every single safety <laughs> took like six steps forward on that play. And there's no one in the same universe as the receiver. Uh, it looked like it was closer than it was because Timmy McLean has a noodle arm. Uh, but it was still awful coverage um, by us. And good on uh, UCF for taking advantage of our defensive backs, knowing we cannot uh, seem to stay disciplined on the back end. Uh, very, very frustrating performance in some ways. But in other ways, it was uh, positive honestly ended up being fairly similar to how they played last week uh the difference is that we won this game and so and Siegel didn't get exposed as bad that is true uh it was just everybody getting exposed instead i mean i don't think anyone didn't get exposed in this game if we're being completely honest with ourselves keenan got lucky yeah keenan did get lucky uh Jacob might be the exception, but everybody got burnt on the flea flicker. I would put that on the entire safety room because not yeah. one person stayed back. Will Lee uh, completely misplayed that touchdown. And still was almost in position, which yeah. is the hilarious part. Yeah. I'm still pretty disappointed with the defensive backs right now. Um, I'm glad that we won the game. They still made some nice aggressive plays uh, at times. Uh, I'm not saying they're bad, but... Uh, I expect a lot more from them. I imagine they expect a lot more from themselves too. So that's probably fair. Uh, so I gave them a C because they can they can do a lot better than what they did. So now moving on to the coordinators, mm, Klein I think had another just slightly above average day. There were no play calls that blew me away. And there weren't many play calls that made me depressingly sad. In other words, B minus. I gave him a B minus as well. He was extremely unremarkable in this game, which I will say I'm happy that he adjusted to them not knowing how to stop DJ for the most part. I'm very happy that he just started handing DJ the ball, made that most of our offense. I think that was a good idea. And, uh, um, other than that, yeah, there weren't a ton of incredible play calls that worked. I liked some of the things he was drawing up uh, to help us go deep. Uh, I liked the uh, play call to Oakley. It just didn't work. Um, but it still, it felt a little bit more conservative than we saw last year um, at times. Uh, some of that, again, is probably just there being more tape on his offense. So uh, people are getting used to it. But I, I, I can't be too upset. He, he still did fine. Uh, so, so B- minus for Colin Klein. Klanderman's interesting. Because uh, on the aggregate, I think he called a really good game. But there were a few plays that you just go, Dude, what, what are you doing? However, he did call Spark on the last garbage time drive. Which is objectively hilarious. A plus. No. Um... <laughs> I, I gave him a B. I, the draw plays really hurt. Getting tricked on the trick play really hurt. Honestly, those alone make a pretty convincing argument to not let him get an A. And there were other times that I feel the blitzes he called just weren't well-timed. He's kind of blitzing at odd times, which he does sometimes. That's just kind of his thing. But B. I gave him a B- minus for pretty similar reasons. Um... As a coordinator alone, he just was kind of okay again. Uh, a poorly timed blitz call led to uh, directly led to a touchdown. Um, we didn't fix much on um, the safeties covering over the top, uh, which especially is important for uh, Joe Klanerman since he's the safeties coach. Yeah. Um, but we generally did a good job of getting pressure. Um, we generally did a good job in the regular passing game uh we were just getting beat by explosive plays again uh which is going to get really annoying if that's what happens all season but uh, ucf countering that ucf is probably one of the more explosive we've kind of faced two of the most explosive offenses we will face back to back the thing is is mizzou weren't they like super lowly rated in explosiveness yeah. before yes, yes. 
Yeah, so, and UCF, they've got great rack threats, but we know that Timmy McLean is not a fantastic quarterback. Uh, he's got a noodle arm. I'm still pretty disappointed uh, in how we uh, have been scheming against this. I get that he's trying to take away the closer stuff, probably because he knows that Timmy McLean has a noodle arm, but we've now been burnt two weeks in a row. We might want to invest some resources in how to not get burnt <laughs> and uh I, i'm sure he's aware of that but uh, he get he still gets a b minus though because other than the major glaring mistakes he still was pretty solid and wasn't awful um outside of just the the big mistakes yeah now we get to go through mvps this is really easy it's dj and des yeah i have no arguments there dj had the best game out of anyone on the entire roster all year. And Dez was Dez. He was fantastic in run defense. There's not much else to really say. Yeah. Then we can get away from our, or get into our just takeaways. DJ's good. And DJ has more Twitch than anyone wants to give him credit for. Which, you and I have been joking for, I think about a year now, (laughs) that... We saw some idiots on Twitter just saying, oh, DJ's so slow. He doesn't have any any ability to make people miss. He's just a power back. And you and I just kind of had a good laugh about that because we knew it wasn't true. Because, you know, he's also a receiving back, and he also had proven that season that he could make people miss. He put, like, multiple Power 5 Division One athletes in a chair and told them to sit the hell down. Well, he went around them. <laughs> yeah. No moves, by the way. Yeah, he has no moves, obviously. Um, yeah, I hope that DJ was able to put to rest the stereotype he's received as being a power back. I get why he had it, because he's um, a bigger running back than we've really had in the climbing era. Um, I think he's probably our first starting running back to be under or be over six foot uh, since climbing got here with uh, James Gilbert and then Deuce Vaughn the rest of the way and Harry Trotter is like 5'11 or something like that so he he's a lot taller than we're used to and he does bring a lot of power to his game he's uh, really great at bouncing off contact got incredible contact balance uh, he does a lot of he has a lot of power back traits but he's not limited to them no. he he has a lot more to his game and that's why he's probably an NFL running back uh, is he, he has a lot of facets to his game. He was a fantastic receiver. Uh, he, he looked really fluid and natural catching the ball. He had one particularly fantastic catch. Uh, he's good. He's just a complete package at running back. And I, I, I think he's hopefully finally shown everybody that he is more than a power back. You have to account for him in several different facets. Yeah. I think a lot of people expected the missing Treshawn Ward this game would hurt. Nope. <laughs> DJ Giddens was fine. Um, the next up is that the offensive line looked considerably better and top to bottom, I would say, uh, other than BB. BB is always great. <laughs> but KT looked slightly improved from the previous weeks. Panzer's quietly been having a good season anyway. Gilly, and then Carver Willis also just had himself a pretty solid game uh, with, you know, tagging in Duffy on occasion. So the line looked really improved against a UCF defensive line that wasn't bad. Um, I, you know, they're fine. They're a good, like, solid defensive line. But still being able to hold your own after the struggles of the first few games of the season, I think that was, it was good to see the progress. No, I completely agree. Uh, They looked a lot better at almost every position. Uh, You could argue every position, honestly. Um, I I, I generally was pretty happy with them. I was watching them more closely early in the game, but for the most part, outside of sometimes in the run block, they were really, really great, Mm -hmm. I thought. Um, Definitely their best game on the year. Looked closer uh, to form from last year than at any particular point. And 
I was very happy that Carver Willis was finally able to take a pretty notable noticeable step uh, in the right direction. Uh, so all in all, uh, kudos to the offensive line. Uh, very happy with their play. Yeah. Next up is the defensive backs. Luck is improving, but it's still not good. They went from having among the worst luck in the country to now it's probably bottom 15. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Keenan Garber got lucky um, at one point. With, Thank God, yeah. finally. <laughs> he he has absolutely earned um, uh, some some good karma there. He uh, uh, just has um, multiple times just gotten barely beat for a ridiculous catch. And luckily that ridiculous catch was dropped this time. Uh, so <laughs> Bailed by the ground. Yeah, so he, he got very lucky there. Um, then other than that, it's still, like you said, it's still not great. Uh, the flea flicker was just absolutely infuriating uh, to watch. I generally, though, felt they played a bit better than the Missouri game. We didn't get burnt quite as much, but when we did get burnt, it was still accounting for a huge big-time touchdown. So we we need to get better in that regard. And if we're going to let them score, we need to at least let it take a little longer than, like, two plays. But still, it, at least they are improving on that front. But still, with how good... Uh, Coach Kleinman and Coach Klanderman uh, are a coaching defensive backs. I have pretty high hopes and expectations for them. So uh, they, they should be an anchor unit of this team by the end of the year, in my book. Well said. Next up is Austin Romaine is still very young, but he's not going to be a liability on the aggregate. And as a sub point, Jake Clifton being back is huge because Clifton is legitimately really good. <laughs> yeah, Jake Clifton is going to be an NFL linebacker, I think. There's a reason that OU wanted him late in the recruiting cycle. Uh, he's, he's legit. He's really good. And he's going to be a problem uh, for um, opposing offenses to have to deal with. Uh, that much is clear. I I really like what he brings to the uh, to the defense. I just hope he gets fully healthy and then he can become the number one guy and Romaine can spell him and not the other way around. Uh, yeah. Because I, I really like Romaine and that backup role right now because he's not quite ready to be a starter. No, not quite. Uh, lastly, the bye week is coming at a very opportune time. Uh, KJ gets another week of rest. Treshawn Ward should be back the week after. Will finally, or hopefully, gets a chance to get 100%. Jake Clifton gets another week of rehab. Christian Duffy gets another week of rehab. It is a beautifully timed bye week. Uh, Plus, you're going into the Oklahoma State game, which, while Stillwater is a very scary place, this Oklahoma State squad... Not to tip the hand. Pretty bad. <laughs> yeah. They've not exactly looked great so far this year. They somehow beat Arizona State on the road. I don't know how they did that. <laughs> but they lost to an also not very good Iowa State team. They got beat at home by 20-plus by South Alabama. Uh, they seem to have finally decided on a quarterback, but... It's Alan Bowman. Yeah, it's Alan Bowman. So <laughs> uh, we'll see if he takes a massive step between now and when we play Oklahoma State. I'm not anticipating that, but I still don't want to overlook this game. But this is a game that I'm going to be pretty upset if we aren't coming away with, I think. This is one that if we're going to repeat uh, going to Arlington, we absolutely have to have this game. Uh, this is... It's the sort of game you can't afford to lose if you want to have a shot at a Big 12 championship again. And luckily, you get a week to prepare for it. Exactly. Bye week is at the perfect time. Yeah. you have any final thoughts about this game before we 
ride off into the sunset and get a week off of doing a preview episode. Uh, coming away with this game is huge. It simultaneously both looks closer and less close than it was just because of the game was legitimately close for quite a while that we really pulled away there and the score was made a little closer uh, by an insignificant touchdown at the very end. So this final score, regardless of what it was, probably wouldn't have really reflected how the uh, game really went. Uh, so kind of a confusing game in that way, but um, K-State was able to flip the script from uh, the Mizzou game and uh, finish strong. Yep, I agree. So the next time we'll, we'll be talking to you will be this upcoming week's weekly recap then the Oklahoma State preview. But until then, thank you all for listening to this episode of the Aggieville Alley Cats podcast. If you want to follow or contact the show, you can follow us anywhere at Aggieville A Cats. If you want to email us, we're Aggieville Alley Cats at gmail.com. If you want to follow us on a more personal note, I am at AC Edward 00. I am at Connor Baltazor, capital C, capital B. And if you want to support the show financially, please be sure to check out the official Aggieville Alley Cats merch store. Link in both the podcast description and our Twitter bio. But most importantly, thank you all for listening to this episode of the Aggieville Alley Cats podcast. Where come rain, shine, or anything in between, we're here to deliver to you the Kansas State sporting news that you so love. Stay safe, Alley.